The Secret Science Behind Miracles by Max Freedom Long Chapter 3 In the bulky literature which has grown up around psychic phenomena and spiritualism during the century just past, scattered postulations are to be found covering the possible part magnetism may have in the action of motricity on objects. This is a most exciting and promising line of thought, and because of the unexplored territory which it still surrounds, it is recommended to the reader as a fine place to begin working with a view to helping to move forward the general investigation of magic. We suppose that gravity is akin to magnetism and that magnetism is to be found where there is a current of electrical nature. There might be something of a push and pull nature involved in the movement of tables and other objects. The kahunas recognized the magnetic and opposite repulsive nature of vital force of motricity, but unfortunately they left no detailed exposition of the subject. They knew the force as a thing which had to do with all thought processes and bodily activity. It was the essence of life itself. The kahuna symbol for this force was water. Water flows, so does the vital force. Water fills things, so does the vital force. Water may leak away, so may vital force. Dr. Brigham spent a considerable time studying the ancient kahuna practice of holding heavy wooden sticks in the hands and by an effort of mind causing bodily electricity to enter a stick and charge it heavily. These sticks were formerly used in battle. The kahunas, standing in the rear lines, charging large sticks and then throwing them at one of the enemy. Upon contact with the sticks, even the strongest warriors were often made unconscious. Dr. Brigham had tested the power of such sticks and had found them capable of giving what seemed to be an electric shock of a peculiar kind. The shock numbed the limb which was touched and made the head swim. It was recalled that the American Indians had a similar knowledge and practice. In brackets it says, they were also fire handlers, and some are today. Close bracket. An early account in the government archives tells us how a medicine man exhibited his magic power by touching a strong brave on the chest with a forefinger, knocking him to the ground in an unconditioned, unconscious condition. While the chance of an element of hypnotic suggestion being mixed in such performances must not be overlooked, it would seem that there is a very definite shocking power to be found in excess ac accumulations of vital force. The part played by the mind and will in causing such an accumulation either in a throwing stick or a forefinger, as above mentioned, seems very important. W. R. Stewart during his preliminary training under the Berber Kahuna was told that vital force could be stored in wood, stone, water, and the human body, also in the invisible body of a ghost. This force could be expended suddenly and thus move very heavy objects. A demonstration of the magnetic nature of the force and of an intelligence of spirit of a subhuman or off-human level was made by Lucci, L-U-C-C-H-I, for Stewart's benefit at night and on the hillside where a large stone was covered by wooden doors resembling cellar doors. These doors were pulled up and they descended steps cut into the soil. The rock projected from the end of the cellar-like cave at the bottom. By torchlight, a hen was killed, 
and its blood allowed to fall on the face of the stone. An invocation was spoken, addressed to the spirit supposed to reside in the stone at times. The hen was then dropped on the ground before the stone, but it soon rose in the air and pressed against the stone. A moment later, Stuart, who had approached closer and held his torch down to have a better look, felt a powerful magnetic pull, which almost jerked him forward against the rock. He was caught and pulled back by some effort by Lucci, who immediately insisted that they leave. Stuart never learned what intelligence had been invoked, or for what such invocations were used in the course of daily magical practice. His guess was that the spirit which had made its presence known in the rock was a nature spirit and that it had something to do with the evil, no, that it had something to do with the soil or the pasturage of weather. Pasturage? P-A-S-T-U-R-A-G-E, or weather. Oh, let me start the sentence again. I seem to have scrambled it. His guess was that the spirit, which had made its presence known in the rock, was a nature spirit, and that it had something to do with the soil, or the pasturage, or weather, all very important to the Berbers and their herds. It was his private opinion that this spirit and its powers were inimical to man and probably dangerous to any but a skilled kahuna. Lucci had made the statement that all dealing with such spirits must follow a carefully observed ritual and that any change in the ritual might cause trouble. Stuart had changed the usual course of the rite by stepping close to the rock at the wrong time. He was told he should have stood back until all life force in the hen had been absorbed by the spirit, the latter needing it to use in complying with the requests made in the invocation, after which the body of the fowl would have dropped. Stuart was reminded of the many tales of jinn or nature demons current in Arab folklore. Jinn being J-I-N-N. Jinn or nature demons current in Arab folklore. Hmm. If some types of movement of objects by unseen forces could be proved to be largely dependent on the magnetic pull or push of electrovital force, we should have made a discovery of the first magnitude. The conclusion might be twofold. One, that the force could push or pull objects here and there without guidance from any spirit, living, conscious mind, or any other intelligence. Two, that the force would act, or could act, rather, that the force could act without visible or invisible substance to serve as a hand or even without invisible ectoplasm substance to use, but with some etheric matter, perhaps through which to move in wave form. Open brackets. The theory of the ethers is still controversial. Today, science gives us ether to fill void space and interpenetrate full space, and tomorrow it takes it away from us. Close bracket. Magnets pull iron objects to them and in turn are pulled towards the objects. If a magnet were placed on a shingle in a tub of water and a nail placed on a second shingle quite near, the magnetic pull would cause both shingles to drift closer together. In other words, one shingle would not remain stationary while the other one was pulled. Animal magnetism or vital force is amazing in that it displays a pull on the nail but no balancing pull on the magnet, so to speak. 
Mr. Arthur Spray, S-P-R-A-Y, a cobbler near London, well known to a friend of mine, is a powerful hypnotist. In his book, The Mysterious Cobbler, he tells of a most intriguing and entirely inexplicable phenomenon which he has recently met in his practice as a hypnotic healer. He demonstrated this phenomenon before a group of newspaper correspondents on one notable occasion. Taking a young man who was a good subject, he had him lie at full length on the floor, then placed him in a deep hypnotic sleep in which his body became rigid. Then, standing at the feet of the prone subject, he ordered him to open his eyes. When the eyes opened and looked up at him, he began beckoning with his right hand. Slowly, the head and shoulders of the subject rose of their own accord into the air, the heels remain, remaining on the floor. Inch by inch, the rigid body lifted at the head until it stood suspended at a right angle, a good four feet from the carpet. It was held there for a few seconds and then the beckoning of the hand was reversed and the body slowly descended to the floor. During this experiment, Spray felt no pull on his body or hand. While the young man weighed over 140 pounds, Spray did not feel the need of lifting an ounce to cause him to rise. This experiment has been duplicated by other hypnotists, so we may accept the evidence of a one-sided pulling nature in human magnetism, which seems to result from an accumulation of the electrovital force charges, these charges being built up through some physical action set in motion by the willed command. Baron Eugene Furson, F-E-R-S-O-N, demonstrated this one-sided magnetic pull in Honolulu several years ago before large class groups. He believed that by making a mental command, he could draw from the atmosphere an electrical force. There was no doubt that he did draw force from some source, and his pupils readily learned the knack of the process. Under his instruction, one pupil would make the mental command to himself to accumulate a surcharge of force. When satisfied that such a surcharge had been attracted, probably generated in the body of the oxidation of foods, the charged pupil would place his hands on the shoulders of the uncharged pupil and then draw them slowly away. If the surcharge was sufficient, the uncharged pupil would be pulled strongly after the hands as they were removed. However, there was no sense of pull on the hands of the surcharged pupil. I once saw Baron Furson demonstrate the peculiarity of this form of magnetism by placing his hand on a light folding chair which stood in a row of similar chairs against the wall. He willed the magnetism to leave his body and enter the chair. He then called a sensitive young woman from the next room and asked her to walk along the row of chairs. She did so, and as she came opposite the magnetized chair, she was almost violently pulled down upon it. The young lady weighed at least ten times as much as the chair, and one might expect that the chair to one might expect the chair to rise and press itself against her body, but the action was just the opposite. The rule seems to be that the object, regardless of its size or weight, which has the heavier charge of vital magnetic force, pulls to it the less charged object, feeling no corresponding pull on itself as a reaction. This magnetic force acts over a space of several feet and through such obstacles as cement walls. Baron Furson, after charging himself, 
took his place on one side of a ten-inch cement wall, while his class stood in an arched opening where both sides of the wall could be seen. On the opposite side of the wall, the sensitive young lady, in brackets, found to be the most sensitive of the class to the magnetic pole, close bracket, was placed, her back three feet from the wall and with a man stationed on each side to hold her by the arms to keep her from being pulled too violently against the wall by the magnetic force exerted by Baron Fersen. Fersen raised his arms and stretched them towards the girl on the other side of the wall. Instantly, she was so powerfully pulled that the men had to exert all their strength to keep her from touching the wall. Fersen, on the other hand, stood with his heels together, very erect, and neither felt a pull nor showed any slight sway in the girl's direction. The part that suggestion might play in such a demonstration was discussed by members of the class and to test the magnetic pull without possible implication of suggestion. The pulling effect was tried by two of us on a small bull terrier Dogs are not known to be suggestible. <laughs> uh, we went through the prescribed exercise of accumulating extra force, then placed our charged hands on the rump of the dog, which was made to stand before us, head pointed away. Both the owner of the dog and myself were successful in exerting such a pull on the dog that it was drawn backward several inches despite its clawing at the rug. To resist. We, in our turns, felt no pull at all in our hands or bodies. Dr. Ryan of Duke University, famous for his pioneering in ESP extrasensory perception, has published excellent evidence extending, no, tending to prove that mind can exert an influence over matter without physical contact. In one of his experiments, a machine is used to roll dice. As the cast is made, the experimenter wills the dice to turn up certain sides. A very definite effect has been noted as a result of the use of will. The more one considers the strange action of mind in conjunction with what seems undoubtedly to be vital force, the more easily one can believe in the various phases of magic. For all our proud scientific advancement, we must admit that we are still darkly ignorant when it comes to the secrets of mind, vital forces, and invisible substances. Down the long centuries, there have been current legendary accounts of human flight through the air. The witches were supposed to travel magically to their meetings. The Greek gods flew through the air at will. The adepts of India and Tibet have been said to overcome gravity and float off through the air to distant places in the twinkling of an eye, or they simply fade out in one land and reappear in another. Polynesian folklore is replete with tales of such travels. In modern psychical research, there are numerous instances in which men have been lifted bodily into the air. The famous medium, D. D. Hume, H. U. No, Home, sorry, D. D. Home, H. O. M. E., floated horizontally out of the window of one room and back into the house through the open window of the adjoining room, this on the third floor of the building. If mind has a certain control over matter, it is probably that the control is exerted in some way by means of directing the action of vital force, and through it, the action of magnetism, or even gravity. A number of experiments have been carried on in which the breathing and will used in combination affect gravity. Dr. Harroward Carrington Dean of all psychical researchers in his book, The Story of Psychic Science, 
tells of his experiments with the lifting game in which four people stand ready to lift a fifth with the fingers. All five inhale deeply several times, then hold the breath and make the lift. The person lifted feels lighter than usual. When this game was played on platform scales, the normal combined weight of the five people and the chair was 712 pounds. At the moment of the lifting, the scales registered a loss of weight from 50 to 60 pounds respectively in several tests. Baron Shrink Notzing. Let me spell that. S-C-H-R-E-N-C-K N-O-T-Z-I-N-G Two dots over the I. Uh, over the O, sorry. So, Baron Schrenk Nutzing recorded a case in which a young man practiced breath control and was able to lift himself free of the ground 27 times. The other side of the picture is more obscure, but numerous points, reports have it that individuals have been able, through the use of will and breathing control, to increase their weight greatly. In Hawaii, as in Tibet, according to a recent book, there was used a combination of will breathing to gain magical aid in running long distances. There were especially trained there were especially trained messengers who sometimes held races of sorts in carrying messages for the high chiefs. Their speed and endurance surpassed by far that of men not able to use this form of magic. Another angle of this problem of vital force and its strange motor and magnetic phases awaits exploration. This is the healing power. From time immemorial, there has been the practice of laying on of hands to cure the ailing. It was always apparent that some people had more of this healing power than others. Kings were supposed to have it as their natural right. In religion, prayer accompanies the laying on of hands. In kahuna practice, among the Berbers, W.R. Stewart describes cases of immediate relief from pain when the teacher laid his hands on the sick. She told him that her magical force was so strong that it left her body and went into the stick, one through the simple... Now, let me read this again. Uh, she told him that her magical force was so strong that it left her body and went into the sick, into the sick one through the sim simple process of touching with the hands. Hmm. In more serious cases, she said, she would make a ritual prayer and take time to ready the patient with psychological and ritual cleansings. In Hawaii, the transfer of vital force from the kahuna to his patient or to the spirits of the dead for special ends was common. Baron Fersen told in his Honolulu class of a peculiar effect that he had noted frequently when placing his hands on another for healing or for other reasons. There seemed to be a return flow of negative force. This negative return flow carried substances with it, such as alcohol and nicotine, first and told of having accumulated an excess charge of the vital force. He called it the universal life force. Then, placing his hands on the shoulders of an intoxicated man with the amazing result that he himself became intoxicated to a degree, while the drunk man became almost entirely sober, within a few moments. Mediums at spiritualistic seances have reported such a strong transfer of nicotine from heavy smokers in the circle, hands joined to cause the flow, that they suffered all the symptoms of nicotine poisoning. With heavy smokers removed from the circle, 
the symptoms failed to appear at later sittings. I have watched natural healers lay hands on the sick, making at the same time suggestions that they are drawing out the poisons and illnesses with strokes of their hands, and were shaking these off of their hands, making gestures as of shaking water from the fingertips. Nearly all such healers are convinced that they actually do draw invisible substances from the sick. Most of them, after finishing their treatment, wash their hands and arms in water, suggesting that they are cleansing themselves of any of the harmful invisible substances drawn from the patient. From my personal observations, the studies of this method of healing I have become, and this method of healing, I have become convinced that almost any healthy person can help the sick by laying on of hands and making a willed command that his force enter the patients and strengthen them. The use of the will, if accompanied by the spoken word, forms a suggestion which may be highly effective. Mesmer, who discovered mesmerism over a century ago, was not aware of the potency of suggestion in connection with the transfer of what he called animal magnetism. However, he had practiced accumulating a surcharge of vital force. Open bracket. While holding a magnet from which he thought he was getting the force. Close bracket. Until he was highly proficient. Let me read that again. However, he had practiced accumulating a surcharge of vital force until he was highly proficient. If we are to believe that the accounts of what he was able to do with the charges of force, he demonstrated healing powers so well that he became famous. At first, he laid his hands on his patients directly. Later, when there were too many patients for individual treatment, he made the willed effort to transfer his force to tubs of water from which iron rods extended. The tubs of water once charged, the patients then approached and grasped the rods. The description of the effect on the patients leaves no doubt but that mesmerism was a working force. Patients reacted differently. Some did not react, and mesmer would touch these usually getting the reaction. There was such healing, no, there was much healing and much hysteria, such as may be caused by light hypnotic suggestion. The sudden transfer of vital force from throwing sticks must be kept in mind in following this line of thoughts. thought. Also, the sudden stunning discharge demonstrated when the American Indian medicine man touched a brave with a forefinger and caused him to lose consciousness at the touch. Hypnotists, after the advent of mesmerism, found that hypnotism could be practiced by suggestion or even by having the patient gaze at a bright point of light. They claimed that no magnetism was needed and none transferred to the patient or subject. This seems to be a mistaken idea. The fact that a hypnotic suggestion is expected of the patient is in itself a suggestion. The fact that the hypnotist is near can account for a transfer of sufficient amount of the vital force to make the suggestion take effect. Later on, we shall look into the kahuna explanation of how the vital force can travel between people without actual physical contact or between the living and the spirits of the dead. At the moment, it is necessary only to call attention to the fact that there is such an exchange and that what we learned from Phineas Quimby, P-H-I-N-E-I-S, Q-U-I-M-B-Y, to call absent treatment is an apparent reality, thanks to the ability 
to send over a distance both the vital force and the healing suggestion. And this concludes chapter three. Chapter four is entitled The Two Souls of Man and the Proofs that There Are Two Instead of One. 